I uh, direct Jewish studies. Uh, it's an honor, a pleasure, and a privilege to welcome Victor Davis Hanson here. He's received many honors and awards, not least of which is the 2002 Distinguished Alumni Award of the University of California, Santa Cruz, for his important work as a scholar of the classical world and his reflections on our contemporary condition. Victor Davis Hanson graduated from Santa Cruz in 1975. He studied at the American School of Classical Studies, went on to receive his PhD from Stanford, also in classics in 1980. In 91, he was awarded an American Philological Association Excellence in Teaching Award. I'm convinced it was because of the fine teaching he had here at Santa Cruz, <laughs> which we still think about. And that award is given yearly to the country's top undergraduate teachers of Greek and Latin. Those of you who care for languages know how important that is. Hansen was a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, a visiting professor of classics at Stanford, and he was also the visiting Schifrin Chair of Military History at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland in 2002-2003. He's the author of a stream of articles, book reviews, newspaper editorials on Greek, agrarian, and military history, as well as essays on contemporary culture. He has written or edited 13 books, including Ripples of Battle, his latest, which was published in autumn 2003. His books and articles have enriched our understanding of the classical world, including the connection of the great city-states of ancient Greece and their supporting and surrounding rural and agricultural environs, an issue I find particularly interesting as a scholar of modern urban culture. Hansen is perhaps, in my view, the most important contemporary voice speaking for values that Thomas Jefferson located at the heart of American political culture. And he speaks as a scholar and as well out of personal experience as someone who grew up in and farmed in the Central Valley. He lives there and I understand continues to work the land as well as serving as a professor of classics at California State University at Fresno and a senior research associate, a Hoover Fellow at Stanford. He speaks to our situation and condition with the long view of the classical scholar and the urgency of the public intellectual, a combination articulated not only by the ancient Greeks, Greeks but their Middle Eastern compatriots, the Jews. The Jewish Studies program is thus doubly honored by his presence here today. He speaks today as part of the work of the Jewish Studies program. We have a regular series of speakers at our research colloquium who enlighten us and help us move forward with our work, our research, by presenting new and often provocative work. We hope you will be interested in joining us at other activities. Jewish Studies is supported by the Humanities Division of the University of California, Santa Cruz, by individual donors, and I see some of you among us, and we thank you for that help. By the Helen and Sanford Diller Endowment for Jewish Studies, and by the Caret Foundation. Today we celebrate, as well, the 25th anniversary of the Caret Foundation. I will say something about that foundation later, which is sponsoring this lecture as part of its 25th anniversary celebrations. Professor Hansen will speak on warfare and democracy in the ancient and contemporary Middle East. Please join me in welcoming him.
Thank you very much. That was a very kind introduction. Um, I'm perfectly willing to discuss the contemporary political situation in the Middle East, but I perhaps should wait until the questions, because I'd like to try to look at the problem in a longer uh, expanse of time and space. Na specifically, the nature of war throughout civilization and how it might enlighten us about the contemporary troubles in the Middle East. We had this idea, I was talking not long ago to somebody, he said, Israel's always fighting. They've been in five wars. This is so unusual. And I thought Heraclitus would disagree. He said, war is the father of us all. Plato said, peace is but a parenthesis. It didn't mean that they liked warfare, but they accepted it as part of the tragic condition. Uh, I once had a master student who went through the fifth century, greatest century in the history of Western civilization in some ways, and Athens was at war 77 out of 100 years. And when I replied to the person who was talking about Israel's wars, I said there are more people who have been killed since World War II than during World War II. And that the United States has been active since Vietnam in places as diverse as Grenada, Somalia, Panama, Gulf War I, whatever we want to call the latest, Serbia, Kosovo. In other words, that it is, seems that it's innate to the human condition that one side or the other is going to achieve or try to achieve by war what they can't during peace. You see that in the ancient world so often that they sometimes come up with Roman numerals. First Peloponnesian War, Second Peloponnesian War. It would be much easier if we said that in the Middle East. First War, Second War, Third War, Fourth War. We say 47, 56, 67, 73, 82. But the ancients sort of said First Punic War, Second Punic War, Third Punic War. In the way that we have World War I, World War II. We thought that we had transcended that primordial state in the Gulf War, so we call it Gulf War. Now I start to see that it has a little Roman numeral, Gulf War I. And, the, and we even see it with battles. First Battle of Manassas, Second Battle of Manassas. Nine battles fought around ancient Thebes. First Coronea, Second Coronea. Whether we like it or not, war seems to be endemic with the species. That does not mean we like that situation, simply that it's part of something we have to accept and the morality of those wars are adjudicated by the landscape in which they take place. So the Greeks, for example, thought the Persian War was a so-called quote-unquote good war because it was trying to save a small society in the southern Balkans of about two million people from a monstrous empire that invaded them in a way that they were troubled about the Peloponnesian War. Moderate oligarchs fighting Democrats, both spoke Greek, 27 years long, usually when people see wars that go on and on and on, like World War I, it's considered a disaster in the way that the War of 1870, the prussia franklin War, is not. So what is a war for? How is it conducted? How many are lost? And what are the eventual results? Usually tell us whether the war enters that murky realm of being just or unjust or effective or a waste of time or a tragedy. In other words, you, we have to look at these things on the individual basis rather than just saying all war is bad. Because after all, all the great isms that originated in Europe in the 19th and 20th century, fascism, Nazism, communism, were either defeated by war or the threat of war, Cold War. And some of our own isms, chattel slavery, I don't think you could tell the greatest, uh, wealthiest class in the history of civilization was probably the 3% who we so-called plantations in the antebellum south who had more capital uh, concentrated in fewer hands than almost any time in history. There was no way you were going to tell those people to give up a system they found lucrative without the threat of war. And I think we should remember that Japanese militarism didn't disappear because we had a dialogue or conflict resolution with Tojo. These are things that are hard for us to accept. But nevertheless, they suggest there's something about this phenomenon that's either innate to the human species or to the nation state. I'm not going to get into that. I know that in 1986, when the United Nations said that war is outlawed, a special group committee said it was not a natural phenomenon. It didn't do any good. It still had them. This means that we should try to accept it on its terms. What makes it break out? Well, in the post-Marx period, I think we look for, obviously, economic exploitation. People are poor, people have been done an injustice, and therefore they go to war out of legitimate grievances. I can say right away that the Greeks would find this absolutely crazy. 
that anybody would think that. I mean, there was an embargo on Megara and all these, but most of the wars that I've looked at in the ancient world are fought over borderland. And the funny thing about borderland in the ancient world, it's worth nothing. It's scrub hills between two nice flat plains that are worth something, and they go out and fight over this. Why? Because it's be symbolic as a matter of state prestige or honor or one-upmanship. It's very interesting to, to see that because it reminds us that Argentina did not go to war in the Falklands to take valuable Malvinas back so that they could cultivate it or find oil there. Rather, a crooked dictatorship declared war to restore failing policies of public opinion and thought that they could get away with it very cheap and humiliate a former colonial power. And this would be good to keep in mind because it suggests that countries like Germany who had more territory and fewer people in 1939 talked about Lebensraum in a way they don't today. Or that Japan that has more people and less territory and no natural resources doesn't seem to want to go to war now, but they felt they just had to in the 30s. More about that later on, what's made the change. I think it has something to do with consensual government. But nevertheless, if you look at the Middle East, for example, I just, we keep hearing that there has to be some oil, there has to be some natural resource, there has to be land. Well, there's plenty of land for everybody in the Middle East. But for whatever reason, when you have a sophisticated society that's liberal and has a consensual government and a free press, and it has the entire engine of Western civilization, it's right around a sea of autocracy, and one small country has a larger gross national product than every country in North Africa from Egypt to Morocco combined, then you have all the classical ingredients for very strong emotions such as jealousy, honor, envy, and you have really the embryo of, of war. The Greeks believed that most people would not say they had uh, illegitimate reasons. They always gave perceived grievances, but unlike us, they had a word for it, a prophosis, a fake, a pretext. It's very funny. Sparta says they had to go to war against Athens because of the fear, the phobos of Athenians in 431. You look back at what the Athenians did, they had almost no provocations. There was really nothing that Sparta couldn't have got through diplomacy. But they were absolutely right that if they didn't do anything, that this engine of Athenian democracy and liberality was sweeping the Aegean. People wanted to invest in it. And they were becoming more and more marginalized. And so it would be as if the Soviet Union had made the same decision to strike in 1988 before this crass popular culture of globalization overwhelmed it, which it did. There's a reason why they didn't. I think it was called deterrence. And I think that's very, very important to, to, to keep in mind that when most sides go to war and they say they have legitimate grievance, it doesn't necessarily mean it's so. I was talking to a person about the Middle East. He said, it's all about the West Bank. If that were true, then 47, 56, and 67 would be about the West Bank. And I don't think it's about the West Bank entirely, or even most of the problem. I think, again, there is a sense, a sense of grievance and that sense of grievance has been magnified partly out of fear, partly out of sense of honor, partly out of envy, out of jealousy. If you look at bin Laden, to take a similar example, he went to war against us on September 11th. If you just forget what he said, remember the pretext what he said. Two reasons he went to war, he said. The embargo of Iraq was starving Iraqi children. We know now that Saddam Hussein was starving Iraqi children, but that's over with. And there were 10,000 troops in Saudi Arabia. They're out now. He didn't say that, okay, I'm not gonna go to war. He also said that Jewish women were walking with bare arms in the holy cities and shrines of Saudi Arabia, which was entirely false. In fact, if you looked at the record, the United States, in as much as any great power has anything other than their own national narrow interests, which most of them do, they have no friends, they just have interests. But nevertheless, if you look at the United States, very funny, it bombed a Christian Orthodox Serbia to stop the extermination of Muslims in Europe when Europe had perfectly willing to let it go on for eight years. It had tried to feed Muslim Somalians. It was the only country, if you go back and look at the record, that really made criticisms to Russia of destroying 80,000 Chetnians. Remember when they went into Grozny, the first 100 Russian tanks got destroyed and they killed seven to 8,000 Muslims in Grozny. So rather than saying Janinengrad, maybe we should say Groznygrad. That was a far greater uh, fight 
It was just, it just boggles the mind. In any case, if we look at the record of the United States, whether it's real politic or not in Afghanistan, it was trying to stop Soviet atheism taking over a traditional society. And if you look at the 19th province of Iraq, which was Kuwait until we went in and liberated the Kuwaitis, you get the impression that the United States didn't have that bad a record. If you look at the combined foreign aid to Egypt, the Palestinians, and Jordan, it was loosely, not necessarily entirely, but loosely in the aggregate equivalent to what we were giving Israel based on the 75 Accords. I think that's important to realize. There wasn't really a legitimate grievance against the United States. And when I saw, I'll give you an example of how these perceived, per, perceived grievances can be very powerful. I saw right after 9-11 the Gallup poll polled 20 one Arab societies. The one that had the highest level of anti-Americanism was Kuwait. 67% said they did not trust the Americans. And when asked specifically why they didn't, the first reason, as you can all imagine, was Israel and our treatment of the Palestinians. If you think and take your breath, this was a country that did not exist in 1990. It was restored by the United States and then proceeded without trials, without adjudication, to ethnically cleanse every Palestinian in Kuwait. 350,000 of them were sent by ship back to Jordan or other places. And so you see that a country doesn't like us because we're too hard on the Palestinians who we're giving $400 million to, and they ethnically cleanse them and were restored to sovereignty by us. So it doesn't mean necessarily there has to be a lot of logic. So why did bin Laden really do it, given the record that we treated Muslims in a particularly, I think, even-handed fashion? There were no Jewish women walking around Mecca. It might be that this engine of crass Western capitalism with globalization had started to, whatever you think about it, make real inroads in everywhere from Latin America to Africa to Southeast Asia, where even former Stalinist places like Vietnam were starting to look like West Hollywood. And out of this culture, whether it's bare navels or the internet, you start to see all of the traditional hierarchies challenged. The hierarchy of the patriarch, who says the child can marry this person and not that person. The idea of gender apartheid, where somebody doesn't have equal rights. The idea that aut autocratic government can be undermined. The idea that religious tolerance is starting to be accepted by people. Very powerful engine this is. We don't really think of it in the abstract that way. But perhaps Mr. Bin Laden, like the Spartans, out of fear, thought he could preempt and stop this in a way that I think makes perfect sense. I think his only, as we were talking earlier, the only mistake he did is he took off the whole building rather than the top third. If he had taken the top third, I don't think there would have been much, uh, much problem for him. So wars can start, not all the time, whether it's Japan or Germany, out of inflated sense of Lebensraum. Um, perceived grievances. Just one final statement on this. Another person was talking about occupied land. Why did the United Nations have 50% of its UN resolutions over a 40 year period were about the occupation of Israel? I don't think it, of the so called West Bank by Israel. I don't think it had anything to do with the principle of occupation. Otherwise, Tibet would have been a constant reference. It's much bigger than the West Bank. But China is big and powerful, and you don't want to antagonize somebody in the Security Council by condemning them 45 times in a way that you can with Israel. Or the Cyprus question. Turkey gobbled Cyprus, most of it up. Turkey's a powerful country in NATO. Or the Sakhalin Islands that Russia just took after World War II. Nobody talks about the Sakhalin Islands. Nobody talks about the 10% of Germany that was lost to Poland. But Germany's and Poland are, are, are a whole different story than Israel and the West Bank. So, I think it's important to see that when people say there is a real grievance, usually, and they go to war over that, it's usually not necessarily, and I think, rarely true. Why do wars break out? We're told in the era of conflict resolution that it's usually because of miscommunication, misunderstanding. I can't think of one war, and I'd like to have somebody in the question period cite a war that broke out over a misunderstanding. It's hard to start wars. We had a spy plane that was recklessly close to the Chinese coast. It was shot down. We didn't go to war with China. We're told the missiles of October 1962. Imagine nuclear missiles pointed at the United States. We still didn't go to war. We say, well, we almost did, but we didn't. And I don't think that World War I was 
started by a miscommunication. World War II surely wasn't. Only a miscommunication in the sense of intent, somebody misreading another power's intention to provide deterrence. But they're very, very hard to start. And if they sometimes and often start out of perceived grievances and not out of action, how does shooting start? Why do people, we, we have real differences with China. We have real differences with other countries. We don't necessarily go to war with them. It seems to me, whether we like it or not, that there's this old classical idea of deterrence. I'm reminded that for years, probably from 379 BC to 371, Sparta routinely invaded Thebes, and Thebes took it. And suddenly in 371, the Spartan army miraculously, although it outnumbered the Thebans two to one, was destroyed or almost destroyed at the Battle of Leuctra. And the next year, the, the Thebans not only went on the offensive, they went down and dismantled the entire Spartan state because for the first time they thought they could because Sparta had lost the sense of deterrence. That's a theme throughout Thucydides' history. Each time the Athenians or the Spartans suffer a setback, all of a sudden they find their opponents are increased and the likelihood of further war increases because they've lost this sense of deterrence. If we were to apply this very primitive way of thinking, and it is primitive, to our own war against terror in the Middle East, it might be something like this, that this war could have been envisioned as starting 25 years ago in November 1979 when the Iranian embassy was stormed and we really didn't do much. There were 262 Marines killed in one day in Lebanon, and the embassy and the annex that year were blown up. Other than a few shelling by the USS New Jersey, there wasn't much of a reaction. The East African embassies were attacked. There was various murders, some planes blown up. Kobar Towers, where they killed a lot of Americans in that. First World Trade Center, USS Kolb. Whether we knew it or not, we were giving the impression that the United States was at its greatest period of affluence and leisure and either could not or would not revert back to this primordial world to, to restore its sense of deterrence. If we apply that to Israel, why did the Intifada start? Why all of this at a period when by any measure they had the most liberal government and the most interested, I think, in trying to find a real dialogue? I think if we could bring out some Neanderthal Greek from the past, he would say, well, you should have asked yourself, it was sober and judicious not to reply to Saddam Hussein. That was smart not to do it. You would have wrecked the coalition, but there was a reason why there were 39 minarets in Baghdad glorifying the Scuds. And there were people up on the roofs of Palestine glorifying, hoping that those missiles were filled with gas. And although you could not retaliate, you might have given the impression under coercion of the United States that either you were a new generation that had transcended the old laws of the jungle and you didn't really believe you had to get down on the primordial muck and fight people. This is something out of our past. And if you add the Lebanon, and Lebanon was a disaster. That was a Vietnam. And it was sober and judicious for the Israelis to pull out. But the manner in which they pulled out might have given the impression to the Hezbollah who actually put posters on the border with a decapitated Israeli soldier and Arabic instructions for Hamas to do what they had done. We pushed them out of Lebanon. It's your turn to push them out of Palestine. And although I think it was sober and judicious to offer concessions, I think it almost worked at the Camp David, whether they knew it or not, I think that cemented the impression that a new generation of affluent Western Teenagers were not the same group who had founded the Jewish state in 1947 and either could not or would not react in the same way that we found ourselves faced with 9-11. And what usually happens in these crisis points, and we can go back to ask ourselves, why is it in 338 the Greek city-states cannot stop 30,000 Macedonians who just 150 years stopped a quarter million Persians coming from the north, or why is it that all of a sudden democracies in 1939 decide that they just can't defeat Germany? And why is it that the German army who goes into Poland in 1939 is almost naked on the Western Front? And the French just sit there while they rape Poland, even though they had 250 divisions and the Germans only had 80 facing them. Because I think the idea is they had lost the sense of deterrence and the enemy no longer respected them. If we could go back to this crazy, silly Falklands, I like this example because it's absolutely no stakes whatsoever in those awful, god-awful islands. It might be that that one minesweeper pulled out 
a new government under Margaret Thatcher, a woman who in the machismo culture of Argentina just was too weak to do anything, the British, perhaps by accident, gave the impression that these were not valuable assets and they either would not or would, could not go all the way down in the South Atlantic and restore them. And that's very dangerous when you lose that sense of deterrence and your opponent is someone who's not the end of history and does not necessarily believe in consensual government. And usually when that happens, then you need somebody to come in that's caricatured in the past, fat, drunk, ugly, whoever. Maybe sometimes it's a Churchill, you bring him out of the closet, you say, restore deterrence, a man whose career was ended. Or perhaps it's, who knows? I'm not impressed with the uh, vocabulary of George Bush, but he, they brought him out and he's, this is what he's supposed to do. Just, and I don't think the Israelis were ever have elected Ariel Sharon, but they basically brought him out of their past and they said, pushed him out and said, you've got to tell the enemy that we are not a luxurious, idle, chattering class and you restore deterrence. And when you're done, whether it's Churchill or whether it's Sharon or whether it's Bush, then get the hell out of here because we have no place in a polite, legitimate, consensual society. But for this moment and at this time, you have a duty, and that's to restore deterrence. And that, I think, is what Mr. Sharon is trying to do. When these wars break out, then usually, to recap, war is common. They're usually over non-economic but perceived grievances that can really turn in if one side is naive enough to lose the sense of deterrence into a shooting war. What happens when the war begins? That would be arrogant to say over well, time and space that you could have any model or paradigm that would predict who wins or loses. But look at Israel. I had a debate not long ago with the Palestinians. It says the United States gives everything to Israel. Well, we gave 600 Abrams tanks. The Abrams tank is better than Morocco. It's better tank. They have better tanks than Israel does in Egypt. Before 1967, Israel got almost no aid from the United States. In fact, that famous line in Michael Oren where the Israeli envoy goes to De Gaulle and says, just please sell us the spare parts for the Mirage jets. He says, you're from a small country with a sorry history. No thanks. And Israel won. They weren't really armed until after 67. How did Israel win? Well, I think you can make the argument that Israel, in the same manner in Britain, the same manner in America, and Europe, and the Greeks, the answer lies somewhere in Alexander being on the Indus with less than 50,000 men, or Caesar taking all of tribal northwestern Europe with less than six legions, or Cortez with 1,600 men. We're not talking about a matter of morality, but efficacy. And there's something about this strange Western paradigm of consensual government, at least more consensual than the alternative, doesn't mean that the conquistadors were Democrats. But after all, when Cortez was in Tenochtitlan, he was served a writ and sued in the process that he had to address. Impossible under Aztec society. There's something about consensual government, open markets, free press, civic audit, a greater degree of secularism that creates lethality on the battlefield. That whether that's high technology or a Western idea of discipline where you fight in a group and you march on orders, you retreat according to protocol, you have a, a civic audit of your officers that allows you to have military power that's not explicable by the size, small size or population of a Europe versus the alternative, or Israel. Israel has a system that's not explicable just in technology or, or wealth or logistics, but a system that's Western, which brings, gives it enormous uh, military capability and earns at the same time a great deal of hatred. And there's always a way to check that throughout 2,500 years of history by the non-West who realize that a conventional battlefield, usually fought beyond the West in places like Zululand or Midway, uh, there's a way to check that. One of them, of course, is to be parasitic on the West. That is to use Western weaponry and think that you can win without importing the whole cargo of individual liberty and freedom and secularism and, and civilian audit and simply get the weapons. The Japanese tried it. They, Admiral Perry sailed into Tokyo Bay. There was no Western weapons at all. By 1905, it had a better Navy than everybody in the world except uh, Britain, because it had sent 250,000 Japanese students to Western universities and learned this system and grafted onto this Shinto Buddhism uh, militarism. So people have tried that. Saddam Hussein tried to do that, imported weaponry and thought that he could use the uh, romance of Eric, 
Arab tribalism grafted onto Soviet statism and create a, a more efficient military. It doesn't work, but it gives you some element of parity. The people who are making the suicide belts today, all of that explosive is not made in Arab countries. It's, if it is, it's made on Western designs or it's imported from caches that were probably in Eastern Europe. And the same thing is true of RPGs that are killing Americans as we speak in Fallujah. That's an imported parasitic process. That's one way to check Western conventional superiority. The second is, of course, Western societies are more consensual. So what happens, you can appeal to the better angels of their nature. You can have Ted Kennedy say that this is the worst thing since Vietnam and hope that we can have a discussion here and call off the war. Or in Israel, you can, have, you can try to blow up somebody right during a Likud referendum so that you can stop this process, which is apparently very, is bringing a lot of terror and anxiety to the palace. What's more scary if you're a resident of Gaza to have to run Gaza on your own for once and not have somebody to blame? So that's one way of doing it. Remember that the French fleet uh, hosted the Ottomans, <laughs> that is not new, we, we learned, before the Battle of Lepanto. And the Ottoman uh, strategy to nullify Western military intrinsic advantage was always to divide the West between Orthodox Christianity, Roman Catholicism, and Protestantism, trisect the West and be unified. So that's another method. Besides parasitism is to have divisions within the West. We saw it in the UN with France and, and Germany and the United States vis-a-vis -vis Iraq. Another is, as I said, to have debate and a consensual government to call it off. But another is this idea of asymmetry, that because Western societies tend to be very affluent and they derive their strength not necessarily from territory or population alone, but through wealth and education and so-called sophistication, you can kill a Westerner and create, construct a greater loss than if you lose a non-Western, especially when the Western societies have a monopoly over the media. That means, and it goes vice versa with losing people. That means if you go into Janine and you kill 55 people and 26 or so of them are combatants, you can tell the world that that's Janiningrad. That's a terrible thing. And why? Because that's considered asymmetrical. And Grozny, who cares about Grozny that 7,000 people were killed? Who cares about 80,000 Chetnians? Who cares about Kashmir? We had this very strange Orwellian situation we had two nuclear powers, India and Pakistan, and Kashmir. In one week, they killed 110 people, and the world was talking about Janine. And it's because that Janine had captured the popular imagination, and the opponents of Israel realized that the Western media's attention was turned to it, that these particular losses would have value beyond just a single person or two or three, that they could be constructed into something that was quite quite different than actually happened. It's almost as if today, if a person in Fallujah realizes if he has eight kids and one goes out and blows up a man sitting uh, in a park Apache helicopter, if he can take out a man with a BA from West Point that was worth 250000 and a million dollar Apache, that's going to be worth more into the world's value system or to the grievance of the United States than if he loses 10 people. And that's been true throughout the history that Western societies because they're not populous, and they are sophisticated, and they have capital, feel the losses, at least they're perceived to feel the losses much more, and that allows some advantage to the enemy. How do these wars end, then? I wish I could tell you that, and just before I proceed, that's I think explains that Britain was a to a greater degree was westernized than Argentina. So it was across time and space, all the way down to Argentina, to transport troops that were more disciplined, more highly uh, motivated with better technology than Argentina, that either had to import its technology, did not have a consensual society, and did not have the same level of morale. How do these wars end? Getting back to our Falklands example, I wish I could tell you that there was an East Falklands and a West Falklands. The UN went in, made a green line, and then they said that, Mrs. Thatcher, you have to talk to dictator Galtieri. He's a, he's a legitimate interlocutor. Of course, they didn't do that. They were very unilateral, and they preempted, went down there, and they defeated the enemy, and the problem is solved, apparently. If that's true, it suggests that maybe 
that conflict resolution theory only creates what we would call in Latin a bellum interruptum between the First and Second Punic War and the Second and Third Punic War, the First Punic War, uh, it's First Peloponnesian War. There is a First Peloponnesian War and there's a second, but there's not a third because the Spartans were on the Athenian Acropolis and dismantled the reasons to go to war. In the same way, there is not a Fourth Punic War, as horrific as that seems. I was struck by the axis of evil. I know that's a banal term, but who was in it and who wasn't? Vietnam wasn't in it. That's been decided. There's a communist unified country. We lost politically. Japan wasn't in it. The reason we went to war with Japan was a militaristic, adventurous government. That's over with. It's in the family of democratic nations. Germany's not in it. Iraq was. I don't think it'll be in it now. Iran was, because I think that difference has never been uh, solved between the United States or the West and Iran. The idea that a theocratic government is going to use oil revenues and find a way either through some type of terror weapon or nuclear weapons to blackmail or to gain some advantage what it can't on the conventional battle. That's a problem. And North Korea is on. Whatever you think about the Korean War, it was simply over in 1951. And that last two years were just a settled, a bellicose settlement. But we've never really discussed that. The idea that there's going to be a totalitarian Stalinist government that would threaten and be aggressive to the South, which we wanted to progress along the usual Western capitalist paradigm. Those are classical examples, it seems to me, of Bella Interrupta, that they haven't been assigned. And I'm getting, of course, as you can see, to Israel, because 1947, 1956, 1967, 1973, 1982, couple things. One is that there, that there has never been a war where the natural processes have been allowed to proceed. Natural processes were always interrupted by one phenomenon. Remember that. Usually the Soviet Union, Gromyko, most of the time, called up Dean Acheson or Kissinger and said, stop or else. And the United States usually said, if I understand Kissinger's memoirs correctly that he wrote about the Yom Kippur War. Um, can't hear you well, bad connection. Call me tomorrow morning, I'm sleeping. And then he called Gold in my ear and said, you got 24 hours. If you want to put Sharon on the other side, get him over there quick. And then the Soviet Union said, usually, ah, you're, you're deceiving us, he's over there. And, this, and then they threatened Israel directly. And then they stopped. Notice we haven't had a conventional war since 1989, since 82, in fact. And I think the answer is that that classical Soviet deterrent, remember we talked about deterrence, is now absent. And whether it's Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, uh, excuse me, Egypt, if they were to start another war after day six or day seven, there would not be a nuclear-powered country to call the United States to call the Israelis off, and the Israelis, whether they know it or not, have created classical deterrence now, except with two, I think, worries for the future. One, we're into an asymmetrical warfare that we talked about, where they're parasitic of Western technology. They're trying to kill one Westerner for every five Palestinians, and therefore enter a war of, an, of exhaustion or attrition. And most importantly, they're on a breakneck seems to me effort in Iran, in Syria, maybe even Saudi Arabia, to find a surrogate Soviet deterrent, some type of super weapon, gas, bomb, so that if they do start another war, uh, the Israelis will not be able to f finish it in a conventional way. It's a way they weren't in the past. If, say in 1973, if the tanks that came up the Golan, once they were blown up and the Israelis went down, if they had have gone into Damascus, I think, uh, made a very clear demonstration that at any time they wanted, they could do pretty much what they wanted. Blow up the sewer system, blow up the water system, inflict real damage, as horrific as that says. I think today we would have a sense that the Israelis were unpredictable, they were dangerous, and there were no restraints on the use of retaliation. And you probably would have the ingredients of some type of, of uh, resolution, which, re which suggests to me that in the case of bin Laden, getting back to the war on terror, it fits the same paradigm. He, he attacked us because of a perceived grievance. He was able to because we lost the sense of deterrence. Once the war started, the traditional 
Forget what people said, Afghanistan's too far, it's 7,000 miles away, it's the graveyard of the British Empire, it's too cold, it's too high. Forget what they said about Iraq in the beginning. You can't go there, there's sandstorm. A conventional war, the West will always win. But in the unconventional, asymmetrical, psychological aftermath, it's a different story, and we start to see that today. And, and I think we really won't be over the war in terror until one side clearly has won and lost, and that means that people in the Middle East realize that Islamic fundamentalism has the same currency as, say, Nazism in about 1946. By that I mean if you had asked anybody, just think of it, 1941, June, German army is in control of everything from the English Channel to 45 miles outside of Moscow, up from the Arctic Circle in Norway down to the Sahara Desert. This is the new ideology of the ages. It's unstoppable. If you add in Japanese expansionism, it's pretty bleak. You have just the democracies in Britain and the United States. And what's fascinating about that period is the fascistic movements in places like Mexico, forget Spain, everybody knows Spain, but Argentina and other places in Asia. And if you had have said, we can defeat Nazism in 1941, they would have thought you were absolutely crazy. But if you had have said that in 1946, you couldn't have found a Nazi in Germany or Mexico. Nobody said they had anything to do with Nazism. And why was that? Because it was not only defeated and humiliated, but the message was sent, if you were connected with it, it was synonymous with your own ruin. And until you can create that climate with Islamic fundamentalism, I don't think the war will end. Why do we find, I'm concluding now, why do we find this so disturbing? It's reptilian, it's Neanderthal, that the idea that Think about the, this Greek way of looking at war and peace. It suggests that people might not have as much ideology as wanting to be on the winning team. It would suggest that people in Iraq kind of want to join the Americans, but only if we're winning, so they know if they step forward, they're going to be on the, the winning side. It, it would suggest that Libya has no ideology, but it only came forward because this crazy Gaddafi didn't want to end up like Saddam Hussein, or Dr. Khan in Pakistan suddenly divulges all this horrific information because he thinks that the government of Pakistan is putting pressure because we're putting pressure because we went into Afghanistan, or that Iran suddenly wants to bring in the UN, and I don't think they will want to bring in the UN if we fail in Iraq. It's, it's a pretty depressing scenario that not ideology, not idealism, much less idealism, uh, there's a certain logic of war and peace, and it's the sense of deterrence and advantage and power. It doesn't mean that we have to accept this and like it. We don't want to be real politique. I think that was a great tragedy of the Kissinger administration. It was completely without idealism. It just means that we have to realize that until we get to the end of history, we're all on the same page of consensual governments. Because that's the nice, I want to end on a, a happy note. And that is throughout history, it's very rare for a consensual society to attack another consensual society. Not since ancient Athens attacked Sicily. And it's hard to know quite what the constitution of Sicily is. We're told it was democratic. Do you see that? Democrat, democracies, uh, 1812, their parliamentary government in England is not quite democratic like America. The Boer Parliament, not quite like England. Confederate Senate, not quite. It's very rare to find any case um, where democracy will fight another. So what, what's the prescription, the prognosis for Israel for the future? It's, I think it's deterrence, deterrence, deterrence until there's a change of mind in the Middle East and that these differences that people have can be adjudicated through peaceful uh, negotiation by like-minded, I don't mean like cultures, but people who accept the principles of constitutional government. I don't think that will come until the people who have got so much advantage of not doing that are defeated and humiliated. It may take 10 years, it may take 20, it may take 50, but in the meantime, it's critical that the civilization of Israel is protected by people like, of all, people, somebody like Ariel Sharon. I just want to finish with a final comment about Israel. I've been to Europe about five or six times this year, and I spoke at about 20 or 30 campuses. And I've never seen such hostility toward Israel, anti-Semitism. I don't know whether it's because of real politics, that the Arabs have oil and Israel doesn't, demographic crisis in, in Europe, fear of uh, Islamic peoples that have clout in Europe, fear of terror, 
association with Israel with colonialism, guilt over colonialism, association of Israel with the United States. But it doesn't make sense, is what I'm trying to tell you, that sophisticated European people can't get a basic no-brainer question, that you have a consensual society with a free press right next to autocracy. And it's liberal in every sense of it, whether it's every left-wing issue that you want to look at, whether it's treatment of homosexuals or feminism or free press or religious tolerance. A Shiite Muslim has a, more, a better chance to, to worship in Israel than he does in Saudi Arabia. But, but it doesn't make sense. And what I want to end on is that I grew up in the San Joaquin Valley, very conservative place. I never met a person my age who was Jewish till I came to UC Santa Cruz. I remember asking professors, who, what are Jews? I really didn't know. It was a very rural society. I'd heard about them. This is what's important. Uh, I had a lot of neighbors, many from Armenia and Lebanon, but other people from all around the world who, every time the price was low, they said the Jews did it. Well, who were these Jews? Well, they were some murky people in New York that sort of finagled all the futures of our fruit. So if I would go down on the alleyway and I'd say, Grandpa, can we buy a new truck? No, no, we can't. And I'd say, why? And he'd say, well, it's a bad year. And I said, well, so-and-so across the road said the Jews took all our money in New York. And, no, 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 that's what people do. And he would say this, that's what people do who believe that there's fluoride is poisoning you and there's a white race. The point I'm making is anti-Semitism was easily identifiable with a sort of fringe group on the right in the United States. It was not fashionable among high circles, and it was surely not associated with the left. But the last trips that I go to Europe and in the United States, it's much more dangerous as I see it now because under the cover of fashionable leftist politics, everything I've seen and heard in the last three years in Europe and the United States that's critical of Israel and Jews in general has come from somebody on the left. And usually it's under the idea of progressive politics whether it's uh, guilt over neocolonialism. And we have seen, in my view, one of the greatest transmogrifications of an idea in our time, and that is that Palestinians who have some legitimate grievances nevertheless function within a tribal autocratic society that does not have the same liberal vision of civilization as Israel and has grafted that cause onto the whole wider scope of victimology on the university campus. And it has allowed people to say things and do things that otherwise would be absolutely impossible. And I think I'll leave you with that note because it seems to me that the challenge of everybody is not to be silent when that happens, but to speak out. And to, whatever your ideology or your current or prior politics are, I think that each generation has a challenge. When I was growing up in rural California in the 50s, the challenge was from the Neanderthal right. And I think that challenge is met. Today I see it from the boutique, aristocratic, and sophisticated left. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Ted Goldstein, Oaks 83. Um, let's see. In, um, I can't remember if it was the tape after 9-11 or one of the tapes soon after that, but I remember very clearly Osama bin Laden talking about how part of the, the reason of the, the, the war against the West was because of Andalusia. Yes. And I was really struck that, hey, this is a 500 plus year old conflict, right? Here is, you know, the Andalusia, the, the probably the most progressive time you know, of Arab civilization uh, when they had, you know, incredible culture and learning that dwarfed what medieval Europe was coming out of. And, um, you know, the, 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 by comparison, the ruffian Spanish pushing uh, the, uh, the Moors out of Spain. And he's saying, you know, this is, this is the next battle uh, of it. So, for, for, I was thinking, well, gee, if that's a 500-year-old war 
you know, a reprisal from, for them, uh, maybe they expect another 500 years of war. And that we're making our plans on, you know, one month, two months, yeah. we'll be out of uh, uh, the Middle East and, you know, out by June 30th. But in fact, they're planning for a war for 500 years. And our, is our sense of time, you know, totally backwards here between the two, diff two civilizations? Well, Hans Delbruck, the great German military historian, distinguished what he called a war of exhaustion versus a war of annihilation. He said that each strategy had strengths and weaknesses. And I think that's exactly right. That they use the same terminology Bin Laden has with Israel. This is just simply a crusader kingdom. And the crusader kingdoms lasted for 200 years. This has only been there a little over a half a century. It will leave, too. It's a l the long duration of time. And uh, we in the West look at things very differently in the immediate short-term gratification. We're, we're a society of 200 cable, ch 700 cable channels. We're restless, we're impatient, and they're a much more patient society, and they have the lo longer view. I would say, though, that I think that a lot of what he says is not shared by most of the people in the Middle East because from their Viagra to their cell phones to their contact lenses, it all comes from the West. And this, is, this has created these passive, aggressive, and really conflicted emotions. That the, I have it from a lot of students from Saudi Arabia and Kuwait who come to Cal State. And they're attracted by having a girlfriend, having liberality, freedom, and they're also repelled at the same time. And it's very conflicting. So I don't think most people want, uh, they want in the abstract to destroy the West, but they don't want to do it in the concrete because it means the end of everything, as I said, from penicillin to dialysis. And that's why you see these conflicted emotions in Israel. This is the most Orwellian thing I've ever seen, that he's, the Jews are getting out of Gaza, and it's almost like you can't get out of the, you Zionist entity can't get out of Gaza. Because who in the, and I just heard a Palestinian spokesman saying, who's going to supply the electricity? As if somebody's going to say, well, the answer is build a power plant. Don't blame the Jews for not having electricity. So I'm worried about that, absolutely. And, and uh, all fascistic movements, remember what they do, they create a mytho-history, whether it's Hitler or uh, Franco, of, a, of an earlier time, a reactionary earlier time, when inf rather than facing the problems of uh, inflation or the problems of modernism, as, whether it's Hitler or Franco, it's always there was a better time in the past when we were pure in religion and we were pure in race. And if we can just go back to this reactionary purity, then all our problems will uh, disappear. So he's got the classical symptoms of a fascistic mind, Bin Laden does. And I think it's very important to say that the war against terror and the war that Israel is, is dealing, that's a good term to use, fascistic. Arafat's a fascist. Hamas are fascist. Hezbollah are fascist. And I think that's important to use the language in its proper use. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Jack Hain. Also, it's class of 72 Cal. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, Ariel Sharon's recent defeat in, um, uh, in the, by the Likud party, <clears throat> and I was wondering uh, with regard to the disengagement plan, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> at least it was put to a vote. I don't know to the extent to which it will in any way stymie the plan, but, but the causes for that vote, that, that rejection, whether it, that Ariel Sharon's plan was not sufficiently deterrent in the minds of the Likud. And there were other reasons, I'm sure this, the settlers have had political pressure, but to a good extent, I would think that this, the failure of even Ariel Sharon to project a, a deterrent effect uh, by means of this plan was at the uh, root cause for its... Uh, it is, and you've got a problem there, because how can you have a deterrent when you're leaving? So we have this word they call punitive withdraw, to shoot, get out of town shooting your six shooter. But the point that I'm making is that the Likud party is not the majority opinion of Israel. As I understand, it's about 65% favor. It seems to me that at this time and place, Ariel Sharon came up with a beautiful, brilliant idea. And simply, he looked at the demographic crisis of Israel and realized that every Israeli possible, given the security interest of Israel, needed to be in Israel, and that Gaza was a mess, and that the fence was creeping down, and there would be a time where Israel would disconnect psychologically, culturally, for a long period, five years, 10, and then allow uh, this problem to recede into the world's imagination, as, as I say, in the way that Cyprus or Tibet has, and go on with life in Israel. 
And it seems to me that that has put the fear of God into the Palestinians because it has a whole array of questions that we've never asked. Can Hamas really be a government? Can they provide sewage and water the way the Israelis can? What do you do when you can't go in for emergency surgery? What does it mean you can't go in on Monday and blow somebody up? On Tuesday, take your dad to get stitched up. And on Wednesday, have a three-hour coffee break spinning conspiracies. And then on the fourth day, angry that you're not allowed to work. All of these inconsistencies are going to be clarified. And that's why I think people hate Sharon. And uh, I think that um, you'll see a fence. I think you'll see a withdrawal from Gaza. I think you'll see a withdrawal from most settlements, and, and except from a small area in Israel. And I think you'll see it unilaterally. And then Israel can quite legitimately say, we're waiting for a consensual revolution in the West Bank. And if we have any remaining differences, we can talk about them as serious partners. But until then, no thanks. And I think he's got the support of the American people. And I think it's a solution. Uh, Idan Lavari uh, from Monterey. Uh, what do you see as the role of agriculture in this conflict? Israel having a very advanced agricultural um, system, whereas the other Arab countries are very uh, primitive in their agriculture with a lot of waste, and many of them are not even food sufficient. Do you see this as being anything? And do you think that Ariel Sharon owns a very large uh, 1,200 acre farm may have some kind of influence on his perspective on this conflict? It's a strange question. <laughs> but you know, it reminds me that I wrote two books, one Fields Without Dreams and one called The Land Was Everything, about the outrage and anger of the family farmer who couldn't be compete with the corporate agricultural. And I'll be the first to suggest there was outrage that capital formation efficiency was I thought there were cultural values in being family farm, but the point I'm making is that agriculture is part of this dynamism of, of Israel that's Western and has this protocol. If you go there, you know, you, you know you, everybody knows it. Everything's lawful, there's a rule of law, it's a sophisticated society. Uh, the number of scientific articles cited per capita is the highest in the world. And it's plopped right down next to this society that's failing it. Any time you have that, whether it's North Korea or South Korea, or the former China when it was next to Hong Kong, or East and West Germany, or Tijuana and San Diego, you have the prescription for disaster because you draw these emotions up. When people see this thing they want, everybody in the West Bank wants to have a society like that, but from getting from A to Z requires a complete rejection of some of the main tenets of your society, whether that's a tribal attitude that your allegiance to your first cousin rather than the state, or whether it's an idea that women and men are not equal, or whether it's an idea that you have the right to kill somebody who's destroyed the honor of your family through adultery. All of these things, in very, in very subtle ways, explain why Israel is like it is in Palestine. And when you add the idea that you want that system, but you do not want to make the necessary changes to create that system, you have a you, you just open the door and then all of these irrational conspiratorial emotions come in. And that's the problem. And agriculture is one of that in a traditional peasant society. And uh, I can see that I wrote a district. First book I ever wrote was called Warfare and Agriculture. It's about the destruction of agriculture in ancient Greece, olive trees and vines. And to show you, if you look at the number of olive trees in Palestine, it's over 10 million of them. When Israel went in after suicide bombing, one of the things they did to clear some vantage point was deliberately cut down some olive trees. Well, I looked at that, and the number of olive trees was about 100 acres, about 120 to an acre. It was about 1,000 olive trees out of 10 million. There was 4,000 Google searches on the olive trees of Palestine with things in the Manchester Guardian, olive trees wiped out in Palestine because they had such symbolic capital to a traditional society. So again, it's a, it's a, it's a barometer of how uh, irrational and symbolic causes are, are fueling this war. And yet, uh, I'll just give one other anecdote. I was giving a lecture at Santa Clara, and I was heckled by somebody from Palestine. And she gave a long speech, and I said, would you please ask the question? She said, you won't address the problem. I used to be able to go to Brooklyn each year through the Tel Aviv airport. And now I have to go to Amman and then Zurich and then, and this is terrible. But this is after a long diatribe about Israel was 
worthy of destruction. So I said, let me get this straight. The country that you want to destroy, you're angry at because you can't fly out its airport. <laughs> and she said, yes. And I just said, I, I was, it was the end of the day. I was tired. I said, I'll tell you what. And this was after a long anti-American diet. I said, I promise I'll never go to your country if you promise not to go to mine. <laughs> That's all I said. And, it was, it was, and this, is what so, this is what my point was. After saying that, and after having this long, fiery anger, she burst into tears. And she came up with three people and said, we're going to report you to your dean for being cruel and insensitive to me. You can't do that. And what I mean is that there's a perception in the Middle East that the West is decadent and is soft and either is so sensitive and wants not, it's not so much that we want, we're afraid of being convicted of being illiberal, we're afraid of being charged with being illiberal. And that empowers the opponents of Israel. So a person can tell everybody to put not only nuts and bolts, but feces and rat poison in suicide bombs and blow up women and children with always the assumption that if you reply back and destroy somebody who's doing that, like a Sheikh Yassin who's ordering that, there will always be people in the West who will either be utopian pacifists, multiculturalists, or cultural equivalents. It's the same thing. It's all violence, all violence is bad. They know that. And that's the great burden. That's the great strength of the West that we have open debate, but it's also the great burden. Uh, Gil Stein, uh, Stevenson, 71. Uh, sounds to me from what you've been saying that one of the worst things that Israel could do at this point would be to withdraw from the Golan Heights. When you're talking about deterrence, uh, if there would be a withdrawal that, such as Rabin had proposed, that would have probably encouraged uh, further terrorism. Yeah, well, I was fascinated when I went on the Golan Heights, fascinated by looking at the 73 war. Everything I been, ever had been told about the Golan Heights was false. Uh, Israelis in 67 had old-fashioned Sherman tanks. They had patent, out-of-date, obsolete tanks in 73, and they blew apart, sophisticated. So they're still there. You hear these stories. You read about them. And the funny thing about the Golan Heights is that if you've been up there lately, it looks like Napa Valley. You've got all these people from the Napa Valley and UC Davis who went over and made this beautiful society. And, it, and it's not inhabited like the West Bank. It's strategically critical. And it was mostly peopled by the Druze who, given their brothers, would probably rather be in Israel than Syria. All that being said, I think, after talking to hundreds of Israelis, as soon as Syria has an election and a transparent society, maybe in the year 2525, whenever that is, I think that Israel will be more than happy to give it up. I even talked to a person in the winery, and he said to me in a very naive but idealistic fashion, I said, do you have any idea what's going to happen to this winery when you give it back to Syria? And he says, well, someday we'll be able to share joint ownership. I said, no, it won't happen. Not until they change. So I think the idea is to keep on the Golan Heights and tell Syria, we'll be happy to give this over when we feel that you're on the same protocols as we are. And I'm just sorry, that's the way the world is. You shouldn't attack three times. That's what usually happens when you attack. This is the final thing is, you tell, Germany attacked Poland, and they did it twice. And after 1945, the world said, OK, no more. 10% of this country, there's no such thing as get Danzig, it's Gdansk. Sorry, no more. And you don't see Germans blowing themselves up. Maybe they will later, but they're not now. And I think the, the rule of thumb is if you attack a country repeatedly and you lose, that's life's tragic. And you should try to be humane and, and work it out. I think Israel's willing. They gave back everything in the Sinai. Once Egypt, which wasn't even democratic, renounced uh, attack. I don't know if that, how long that'll last because they're not consensual. But nevertheless, it shows you that they're willing to give up land once they find an interlocutor that's democratic. Until that time comes, I wouldn't give up an inch. Um, I'm David Goldblum, and I'm from Aptos, and um, Professor Hansen I knows that I taught in the same institution that he did until I retired, but a completely different subject. It's an awfully difficult, I prepared it before I came, but it's very difficult to put into words, 
And uh, when, you're, when you answered the last but one question, you led me into it. I think you were talking about uh, our uh, appealing to our better nature, how it's abhorrent to us uh, the, uh, to reply in kind to the kind of attacks we're receiving. But I've been trying to think along simple lines about what war means, and you're the expert and I'm not, but surely you probably would agree with me. In the case of modern war, what we've always seen until terrorism came along was our Armies representing countries, uh, all combatants wearing uniforms, there was the idea of a collective grudge, collective responsibility, collective guilt. The terrorist thinks he's found a way around that. He thinks that there's no collective responsibility on his part, but he is entitled, in the case of the Arab uh, Islam terrorists, to uh, kill any Jew anywhere in the world. It seems to me, and I'm asking your opinion, I'm trying to put this in the form of a question, as to how how we face the fact that we, you mentioned another term that helped me, stepping down into the primordial slime. We have to face the fact, how do you feel about facing the fact we've got to step down into the gutter and deal with these people the same way. I, now we've just seen a very bad example of weakness in Fallujah. Um, I think four of our, um, I saw a horrific photograph in a magazine of these charred bodies. Yeah. Well, I think I've probably I, I, said I enough in my question. clumsy way. What do you think of the Short idea of collective? Answer, as Napoleon said about Vienna, to paraphrase Napoleon, if you're going to march on Fallujah, then you've got to take Fallujah. He said that about Vienna. Uh, we're not in a war against terror. Terror is a method. It would be like saying that we're in a war against Mr. Smith 109s, or we're, <laughs> we're in a war with submarines, or we're at war with the KJB. These are all methods. Terrorist is... We all know they have to sleep, they have to use an ATM card, they have sanctuary, and they practice, out of the e they practice under the aegis of the Middle East. And they're, to be fair, their area, Abu Nadal was in Baghdad, Abu Abbas was in Baghdad, Zakari was in Baghdad. Their area of operations is shrinking with the closing down of Iraq and, and Afghanistan. And we know where they operate from. Basically, three places, Iran, Syria, and Lebanon give them tacit support, uh, money, sanctuary, and the war will not be over with until those countries realize that that support is synonymous with some high consequences. I don't think terror is, it's very old. It, it's what the Jews were doing against the Romans with the Sakari. I don't want to advocate that, and especially in front of this audience, but <laughs> remember what the Romans did. I mean, that's where the temple was destroyed, and they used, they did not only destroyed the great temple, they used the proceeds to build the Colosseum. So, as, I guess, adding insult to injury, but the great Mahdi was a terrorist, and uh, the British handled him. There's always a response to terrorism. It's simply to offer a political agenda that makes it better to join in, whether that's the Romans offering habeas corpus and sewers, and a strong idea of collective guilt, that if people harbor those people and aid and abet them, they have to pay a price. The people of Fallujah, not all of them, but there were more than 1,500 people who were aiding and abetting the people who were killing Americans. There were people who were sleeping with RPGs under their blanket, and they knew where to go. And uh, uh, if you want to defeat them, you have to make, I hate to use that term Sherman used, but war so terrible on the people who started it, they won't do it again. And that's very hard for a sophisticated postmodern society. Yes. Professor Hansen, thank you very much for coming. I admire you very much. Um, I am a 1959 graduate of the University of Chicago. <laughs> and I'm Leela Beckwith. Um, would you speak to the complete liberal left silence about apartheid and forced uh, expulsion of people as would occur in the Gaza evacuation? I mean, let me get your question again. My question is, why is it that we use the terms Gaza disengagement, West Bank, evacuation, and we don't use the terms which equally apply of apartheid. You mean in the case of Jews leaving Gaza? Being forced to leave, yes. or forced expulsion. 
or ethnic we cleansing. Because we have this asymmetry in the West, and that means that we all know that the only Arab peoples in the Middle East that can vote and write a letter to the editor live in Israel. That's why there's two, 100, over 150,000 illegal immigrants in Israel. And we all know that we're not supposed to say that. And we all know that right now there would be a solution to the settlers if we just simply said this, that the million Arabs who live in Israel have certain rights under constitutional law, and all of the settlers can still live there if they want under Palestine, and they'll have the same rights and responsibilities as Arabs in Israel. But we all know that that is an absolute bald-faced lie, that as soon as the Palestinian state is created, the people in Gaza who are living there will suffer the same fate as the 900,000 Jews did in Baghdad, Cairo, Damascus between 1947 and nobody talks about them. They were all ethnically cleansed out of the middle because it's this asymmetry where Westerners in their, their I guess it's their overconfidence in the Enlightenment that, that reason can solve all things and we, and we don't realize that these emotions are there and there's this dishonesty. So yes, I agree with everything you say. It's, you have to, they're telling the Israelis, you can't live in that society. You've got to get out because Sharon is telling them, if you stay there, we can't protect you. It's in the long-term interest of you not to be there. And under this Palestinian state, they'll cut every one of your throats in a way that we would never even imagine doing to Arabs. And I, I don't know I have an answer for that. I wrote something in the Wall Street Journal this morning about this horrific prisoners naked. It was terrible what we did, but the fact is it'll be adjudicated. There'll be people court-martialed. There will be a whole national hysteria. Why this was happening, nobody's talking about Macedonian just butchering seven Pakistanis, or nobody's talking about Daniel Pearl's head. The same Arab, I looked at the same newspaper that said shame because a female was looking at the genitalia of eight men and pointing to them. Shame, that same newspaper when Daniel Pearl's head was cut off thought that it was you know basically okay so there's an asymmetry here and we have to recognize it. Hi I'm a sophomore sociology major. Um, I wanted to know how you could say that that uh, Palestinians are being inconsistent when you have when they're faced every day with such things as checkpoints mm -hmm. which are completely economically slowing their lives and and they are controlled by the Israelis. Yeah. So what would you suggest they do? I'm just asking. I'm, I'm curious. Well, no, I just don't think, I don't think that they're being inconsistent by, by going into Israel and, and, you know, having suicide bombs. They, it's, it's, it's all going into each other. They're not... It, Why don't you say that you objected to the Israeli checkpoints because they were demeaning, humiliating? They are. Who wants a checkpoint? So why don't we just not have any checkpoints as was under the, there wasn't very many checkpoints in the year 2000. It's pretty easy. You can go anywhere you want. Why did the checkpoints come? No, in 2001 there were many, many checkpoints. Well, after the Intifada, yeah. The point is that if you don't believe there's any danger and you just get, I, I never, what I try to avoid, maybe you find it crazy, but I don't read what Westerners say. I always read what non-Westerners say about the situation. So when I want to discuss checkpoints and suicide bombing, I read the Arab newspapers. They're all in English now. And just read what they write. And it's, read what Mr. Zakari said the other day. I'll give you an example. He's a terrorist that we're all looking for. Well, he sent a bunch of people to kill everybody in Amman. So they put him on Jordanian TV, which had a translated transcript, and the Jordanian government said this is so terrible that he could have killed 80,000 Muslims with chemical weapons. And he sent out an infomercial, fatwa, or whatever we call it, and he said, I did not use chemical weapons. I was just trying to kill people. If I had to use chemical weapons and I had them, that would prove I had them, I would have killed all the Jews. But the fact that I haven't killed any Jews with chemical weapons shows that I don't have any, so don't you know, impugn my motives. I just want to kill people normally. And when you're dealing with that, I don't see that checkpoints, you know, I don't know what example that you have. If you say, well, checkpoints are there because you've got to get out of the West Bank. Well, they're getting out of the West Bank. They're going to give 97% of the West Bank back. They've already said that. But I have a feeling that they're still going to have people in Palestine that want to come into Israel. I don't think a lot, once the settlers get out of Gaza, you won't have any Israelis that want to go into Gaza. 
but you'll have a lot of Palestinians that want to get into Israel. And that, you have to ask yourself why that is. Why are all the Palestinians dying every day to come into Israel? And the Israelis are not dying every That's why you have checkpoints. And when that answer is solved, you'll have peace. If you can answer to yourself why it is that God, Palestinians want to go into Israel and work or live, there's 100,000 illegal aliens in Israel. These are, what, settlers? You could call them settlers. Why is that? And if we can find the answer, then we can find peace. Well, but then is it, are the is the Israeli army just going into Gaza and, and just like shooting people point blank because of the Palestinians doing something wrong? Because, I mean, uh, they don't well, have... Well, I think, yeah, I think that's the idea that Hamas is the radio station. <laughs> right, but... but there is but a it's, difference. But it's Let me finish. Into, there is a okay. difference between... This is very important on the university campus because in the 1980s, we came up with this idea of conflict resolution and moral equivalence. And we've raised a whole generation that really does believe it's the same thing to shoot a pregnant woman and shoot all four girls and execute them, that's the same thing as blowing apart with an Apache helicopter a mastermind who ordered that. And I don't think it's the same, and that's where we differ. Thank you.